Good morning, Jeff. Good morning, Jeff. Between tonight's show in Hex, obviously. Uh, this time we are going to talk about data center overlays. So we've spent significant amount of time talking about underlay, BGP being the routing protocol and data center, importance of right design, ECMP, fast convergence, and many, many other topics. So to do quick recap, we talked about SN allocation, and believe it or not, it becomes even more important in overlays. All the problems you get with improper allocation scheme in underlay are a joke compared to what you get in overlay where your leaves start reflecting EVPN routes with different set of attributes. You really don't want this. Make sure your ISN allocation scheme is right. Uh, BGP convergence. Uh, if you look at any VPN technology with BGP, it always relies on recursive resolution next hop. So very important when your next hop in underlay going away, BGP in overlay will figure out next hop disappeared and will recursively reconverge. So fast conversion underlay results in fast convergence in overlay. Very important to understand. Jeff. Yeah, um, so what we, uh, you know, we've talked, well, pretty much since uh, this series began about about BGP and, um, you know, and, and hopefully made the argument for why BGP is is the best choice for uh, for control plane signaling um, and and control plane uh, information distribution in uh, a data center overlay, uh, I'm sorry, underlay uh, data center topology. Uh, but the question that's sort of still out there and which is really leading into what we want to talk about now is, well, what is that information? Um, you certainly know about virtual, I mean, virtualization has been around as long as networks have been around. You know, it's the reason we have so many acronyms with Vs in them. Um, and this drawing here, uh, and by the way, I, uh, this particular drawing uh, is one that I did. The, the, uh, the CLO topologies that you've seen over the last few slides are, are a lot prettier uh, 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 drawings that, uh, that Jeff has done. Uh, this is one that I did for a lecture on, uh, uh, on overlays and such um, sometime back. Uh, but it's still a CLO topology. You can still see uh, leaf switches. You can still see spine switches. The whole um, connectivity issue of every leaf is connected to every spine. And and I should mention, um, Jeff and I kind of talked about this uh, uh, planning for this uh, session. Um, whether we should talk about CLO top topologies or not, and and we we kind of decided that it wasn't really relevant to where we wanted to go here. But if you um, if you want to uh, get an introduction to CLO, uh, exactly what a CLO topology is, uh, things like you know what's the difference between a uh, three stage CLO and a five stage CLO. Uh, what are the parameters for uh, for scaling a CLO topology? Let us know in uh, in the questions, and maybe we'll plan that for a for a later session. Uh, but we're just sort of accepting right now that we have a CLO topology or a leaf and spine to topology, which you can see on the left in this slide. And the question, kind of getting back to where I was going, of well, what is it that we are uh, communicating over BGP, um, and um, and what are we using to virtualize our network? Um, the big problem that probably everybody knows, I mean, and this was around not just for data centers, it goes for uh, enterprise networks too, is that is that simple um, uh, VLANs, like we've always known and loved that have been around for what, 30 years. Um, the VLAN ID is 12 bits, uh, which means you have a maximum of about 4,000 VLANs. 
uh, 4,096 to, to be exact. Um, that doesn't scale, particularly in modern data centers and especially in uh, tenanted um, modern data centers where you have, uh, by tenants, we're talking about uh, different users that need to be completely isolated from each other. Um, and, you know, I guess tenant is a, is a early, uh, early term in cloud technology. But, uh, but anyway, VLANs by themselves, as we all know them, just don't scale to this. Um, and this especially goes if your tenants are not just different organizations within your enterprise, but maybe you are a service provider and you have tenants that, um, that are um, completely different customers. Maybe they want to use the same VLAN IDs. You know, you know that uh, uh, that concept from just overlapping uh, IP addresses at layer three. Well, the same thing might happen at layer two. Um, oh wow! Somebody from Australia, uh, hi Vikas, coming in at uh, two a.m. in the morning. Um, thank you for for taking the time and staying up to to listen to us. So anyway. We've got that problem. We've got that scalability problem. We've also got uh, the problem in this kind of an architecture of massive bum traffic. And if you don't know the term bum, I'm sure you already do, uh, that stands for broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic. Um, and that's just basic switch functionality. I, you know, I have to broadcast something, so I'm going to broadcast it to every switch in the network. Um, I have unknown unicast traffic. Uh, I don't know where uh, what the MAC address is of uh, the device I want to send traffic to. So I, uh, again, uh, flood traffic to everybody. Uh, multicast traffic, with, you know, you've obviously got a lot of multicast members and so you're in a flood traffic. All of that uh, makes for tremendously large amounts of traffic and again, uh, very negatively impacts the scale of your network. Um, and then finally, you, if you have just a single layer two network, you've got huge MAC to IP address uh, mapping tables, um, just your basic uh, switching table that, that everybody thinks of or MAC tables. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously memory limits in your switch and you don't want those tables growing enormous. So all of that means we need to have some way, gosh, what could that possibly be of, uh, of, um, of managing this network and, and, um, um, and virtualizing what we really want to build uh, on top of this simple physical underlay. Hey, look at that and Superman, V and I to the rescue. So obviously VNI is only one of the enhancements. So we move from 12 bit to 24 bits, so much larger address space. However, the most important movement here was moving from layer two spanning tree to IP leaf spine, not necessarily leaf spine to IP networking, mm -hmm. where overlay that initially was to provide layer two connectivity was encapsulated into IP. So we got larger address space, and it's 24 bits for VXLAN, for Genève, for VXLAN GP, or any other NVO3 technology or overlay technology developed over the last 10 years. Can you, um, Jeff, can you, um, can you elaborate? You mentioned, you mentioned uh, Genevieve. Um, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, VXLAN, everybody knows, not necessarily everybody loves, but it's there. So VXLAN was the first technology to provide layer two connectivity over IP. Uh, quick overview, uh, the address space is 24 bits, so 16 million virtual network compared to 4K. Ethernet frame is encapsulated in the IP UDP. We don't need TCP because we don't need reliable trans tra transmission. Very important point, uh, as you know, in IP networks, we use usually five tuple for ECMP, for hashing. Uh, while UDP destination port is IAN allocated, has to be set to 47 NTN. The source port is often used to enrich entropy and make 
load sharing much better. So if an application decides that flow could be completely separated, you know, we need to do load sharing per flow to avoid uh, out of order delivery and traffic within flow taking different paths. Now we could use source port as extended entropy to improve flow sharing, very important. Uh, so IP UDP runs on top of IP really follows your IP topology based on routing. What's important is that at the time it was developed, there were need of market to provide IP overlay for layer two. So to connect layer two hosts that are over IP and there were hardware that could support in a particular way. So I usually call VXLAN as a trade-off decision, not necessarily technical merit. It misses few very important fields. Next protocol is probably the most important one because it wasn't supported by hardware back then. Uh, the main target was to provide layer two connectivity over IP. So to Jeff's question, all new overlay encapsulations came up after solves this problem in a number of ways. All of them have next protocol field, so you know exactly what's inside. Uh, they're all extendable. So VXLAN is fixed. It has number of reserve flags. Some of them are being abused by some vendors to do some stuff irrelevant here, but it's fixed. You want to extend it, you cannot. So both Renif and VXLAN GPE are flexible and give you ability to include a lot of metadata. So if you look at use in the field, Genif is the encapsulation protocol used by NSXT VMware. They include a lot of metadata, they include a lot of stuff in it to signal additional QoS, additional characteristics, what you want because the way it was designed, it's very flexible and actually the amount of data itself could be changed. So it's not a fixed field, it's flex field. And that's mm -hmm. why we don't see a lot of encapsulations of this type done in hardware, because in hardware, we really like fixed offsets, like VXLAN. Yeah. But VXLAN is de facto standard today. You'll see it in every network. And this is what we are having today. Pay attention, VXLAN adds 50 or 54 bytes of overhead if you use dot uh, one q encapsulation. So increase your MTU, pretty much mandatory if you want your network to work. Yeah, and we, you know, one of the things you said about uh, VXLAN being sort of the standard um, these days, it's it's important to point out that that uh, VXLAN is not the only um, overlay technology, either for data centers or uh, for enterprise uh, uh, networks, maybe, um, that's out there. Um, there there were a lot of predecessors, uh, a lot of other technologies that are maybe still kicking around. Um, you know, there's Trill. Uh, Trill kind of was talked about a lot for a while. Um, and then uh, 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 you don't hear as much about it anymore, but uh, you also hear things like PBB and, um, um, and uh, what is it? S S uh, 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 S P B shortest path bridging. Uh, yeah, path bridging. yeah. Um, even Lisp, which uh, Lisp may actually be um, a, uh, um, a an interesting topic to talk about all on its own in a future episode. Sure, we um, can probably get Dina Farinacci to talk about it. Yeah, That's yeah. Important. Um, important. He and, loves to, to talk about Lisp. <laughs> yeah, it'd be great to have him as a guest on here. Um, what else? In, in VGRE, OTV, and all of that. But um, so I guess why I'm saying all that is, uh, what do you see as the the real reason why VXLAN um, is, as you said, kind of the standard now, um, and seems to be overshadowing all of those other technologies. So except given, maybe except how, maybe Lisp. <laughs> yeah, how thick the header is. It's reasonably easy to implement. Most importantly, it looked exactly like another protocol that was supported by the time by Cisco. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it to gradually improve things. So this is pretty much where VXLAN came. It could be done in hardware 
day one and mm -hmm. Broadcom could support it. So most of the market, it's really market decision to do it this way, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what we've seen afterwards, uh, since majority of the traffic is actually not layer two, it's layer three, ability to route VXLAN became a problem. So we all remember Trident 2 couldn't do it. Trident 2 Plus could do it with recirculation. Trident 3 could do it completely. So any new, te any new terminology, any new technology that you're going to use in hardware usually requires some work in hardware. You could do some things through recirculation, meaning you're losing bandwidth internally, or you need new spin of hardware, unless we're talking about programmable silicon, which mm -hmm. is coming up now could be programmed do many things but again there's price to pay so there's no free lunch right but the point being here we had hardware that could support it we need the solution to provide layer two over layer three and this is how the slan came to be really yeah yeah and, and that's actually um it's it's a good point for um for implementation um it's it's a challenge even for me um you can see a piece of my my own lab behind me here um trying to get uh hardware into my lab that supports uh vxlan and evpn and such uh you you can do you know virtual stuff on uh eve and in viral or whatever uh but uh, um but because this tends to be supported in silicon and only certain silicon even within um individual providers um uh, you know for somebody like me trying to lab all this stuff up in hardware um you know and and trying to go out on ebay and buying things it's it's a bit of a, a bit of a challenge um uh, but maybe that's a, a side topic and maybe that's something that's worth talking about again in a future episode is is um uh, you know is the the hardware questions around um you know specifically the the silicon questions around so, uh evpn and, and vxlan so to summarize uh vxlan options so the part that's being seen by devices that forward traffic is vni this is mm -hmm. data plane as we said it's 16 bit sorry 24 bits so it could be 60 million values this value of today has to be unique within vxlan domain what happens when device receive a packet it looks up vni very similarly to how we look up mpls labels in hardware and it yields adjacency to layer two or layer three construct or vlan id depending on implementation but this is really very similar to how we work with mpls you look up the value you have the binding between this value and particular construct in your forwarding base yeah, and maybe the other thing to notice in that uh, in that header, and and this is, I guess, it's true of all overlay tech, uh, topology or technologies. I can't think of an exception to that. Is uh, you know, if you look at the header itself, you've got uh, your payload and your regular Ethernet header that's encapsulated behind VXLAN, which is encapsulated behind UDP and IP uh, v4. Uh, which is just saying this is a tunneling technology. Um, and uh, uh, going to the next slide here, um, specifically looking at um, the VXLAN forwarding plane, um, you can get a better idea here of, of what we mean by a, tun a tunneling technology that the, uh, the, um, we're, we're tunneling um, layer two traffic through a layer three network um and differentiating the tunnel by vnis which you can see here um and we have specific tunnel endpoints called vtaps um uh, that reside on switches these could also uh this is a little bit of a simplistic slide uh those vtaps could also uh reside all the way down in a server um if if you're doing host routing um, but uh, we're showing it just for simplicity uh, with the layer two, layer three boundary existing just at the at the leaf switches. You'll notice everything above the leaf switches is just kind of abstracted away, hence the, the cloud here. Um, and we've got uh, VLANs attached or dedicated to each VTEP. Um, 
what might have been interesting in in this illustration is it would be um you know using the same vlan id over and over because uh, that's one of the ideas of being able to scale everything is is that the vlans are dedicated to specific uh, VTEPs or uh, VXLAN forwarding planes. And so they can um, kind of like with private RFC uh, 1918 addresses, they can be repeated because they're, uh, they're only unique within a particular uh, VXLAN. And when we go further into VPN discussion, we will discuss different service interfaces provided where there could be direct mapping between VLAN to VNI so-called mm -hmm. VLAN-based, uh, map many VLANs to a single VNI, which could be VLAN bundle or VLAN aware service interface. We'll cover them when we talk about EVPN in upcoming talks. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. I'd love to hear about layer two versus layer three VNI um, uh, from, from Vikas. Um, yeah, we're sort of uh, we're sort of covering that, and we'll move more into that. Um, but uh, but one of the the other pieces of of what just what we've presented so far, if we go to the next slide, um, a problem with going no further than what we've had is that the control plane uh, doesn't scale. Um, um, Jeff, if you could advance, there we go. Um, sort of uh, VXLAN all by itself um, either uses a flood and learn uh, um, approach, which is sort of the same thing as, uh, um, as the uh, flooding and learning idea of switches themselves, uh, you know, at, at layer two, where you just, you flood everything you know, and you listen to, uh, to understand what is what the network looks like where where uh, uh, you go to reach other destinations and you learn max and all that sort of thing uh, well it doesn't scale just by default in switches if you have a large architecture it doesn't really scale if you have a v vxlan architecture for the same reasons um, uh, one alternative to that would be to build vxlan all on layer 3 multicast infrastructure so that so that now you limit I mean, it's one of the reasons for multicast is being able to reach a lot of destinations but also limit who the destinations are but now you've got the problems of having to support layer three multicast um, um, and so you're running uh, a pim protocol you might be running um, um, rendezvous points all that kind of thing so that becomes problematic also uh, as the the bullets say here um, you know, IGPs like OSPF and ISIS can route uh, VXLAN, uh, but they don't have any signaling capabilities. Uh, they, I don't want to say they they have no policy capabilities, even though I wrote that there. Um, but uh, uh, they have very limited policy capabilities. Uh, don't scale well and um, um, don't have any way of. Uh, discovering and mapping and filtering uh, destinations. Well, there's a protocol out there that does, and we've been talking about it for a long time, um, uh, which is is BGP. And uh, one of the things that's that's um, that I should mention um, uh, is BGP tends to be the star core protocol for a lot of other kinds of overlays besides just um, um, just uh, EVPN. Um, BGP has been around for a long time for uh, as the core protocol, for example, for NPLS networks. And in fact, that's sort of the originating idea behind EVPN um, is, is uh, you know, you want to, um, you want to consolidate a lot of different virtualized networks on top of one control plane uh, being run by BGP. And so there's a lot of modifications for layer three VPNs and layer two VPNs and all that sort of thing. And that's all kind of the uh, the core idea behind, core idea, that's an unintentional Sorry. pun there, um, of, of uh, using BGP 
uh, as a single protocol that kind of routes them all. So uh, BGP to the rescue. Yeah. And some see it as kitchen sink protocol. I prefer to see it as very versatile and extendable protocol. Totally. So agree. EVPNs. EVPNs came around as an answer to two different domains. In one case, we had VPLS, two different standards that didn't really interwork. We all remember Campella and Martini implementations. So we really needed consolidation in service provider space. And EVPN was the answer to that. In uh, data center space, as we said, we needed a protocol that would provide control plane to overlays. The XLAN on itself doesn't have any control plane. And as Jeff said, you use flood and learn really to learn the MAC addresses. There is no any kind of proxying and uh, ARP and deproxying will be discussing many, many details as we go forward. So the most important thing was without control plane, you cannot scale. There were a number of solutions that did open flow alike. So centralized controller, if you look at uh, early VMware Nisir implementation, the control plane for overlays was implemented over management plane. So you would just signal it through a management plane. Uh, obviously, routing protocols prov provide distributed way scale, supposedly much better than centralized approach. So this is why EVPN came over. It's just another address family on top of address families already supported. Obviously, implement the same way. You signal the capability. You know your peers support it. It scales massively. Uh, there are implementations that supports milliards of routes today. Uh, it applies exactly the same style as well-known in PLSL 3 VPN would do. So it uses router distinguishers to provide unique or to provide additional piece of metadata that is attached to IPM MAC addresses to make them reusable. So in multi-tenancy case, different customers can use same MAC or IP addresses. It provides very flexible uh, import and export target policies. So anytime new route that is either RP or MAC or MAC IP is sent out, it get an route target attached to it. So it's exported. Every other device can decide whether it wants to import this route. So you might get very, very large BGP table, but import only few routes based on your route target policies. So it's exactly the same technology we've been using successfully for LTVPNs and it makes this extremely flexible, multi-tenant per definition, and gives us ability to build any kind of virtual constructs on top of physical topologies. So for example, may you wish a hub and spoke route target gives us ability to do this. May you wish some limited topology, again, you could do this. May you wish to do VRF leaking, again, route targets give you ability to import and export particular routes between different domains. So very, very flexible and proven technology. I think we've just got a couple of minutes left. Um, there were a couple of questions that popped yeah, so up. We could probably stop here for today and answer the questions and then continue next time. Sure. So so one question that, uh, that uh, came up was, is there a perform? Uh, we talked a little bit about uh, in the control plane uh, using unicast uh, uh, BGP versus uh, versus using a multicast topology. And someone asks, is there a real difference between um, between um, is there a scaling difference between unicast and multicast? Absolutely. So it's not really BGP dependent. What you could do in network is using multicast for in-network replication. In other words, there are people or devices that are interested in receiving particular data. They got particular uh, group configured on them. They join the network. The sender mm -hmm. sends single packet with destination set to this multicast address. And then everybody who subscribed to this address received it. So the advantage here, only single copy of packet sent into the network and network takes care of replication. The disadvantage or trade-off is complexity of multicast. A lot of people fear of multicast 
and for a reason, right? Yeah. On another side, uh, and this is what was implemented before a VPN, so-called hidden replication. So anytime traffic needed to be flooded, it would just be replicated by the headend or sender and send as unicast traffic to every other device that needs to receive the traffic. So there are two limitations. Obviously, you are using more bandwidth because you are sending a copy per receiver. Number two, the device itself has to replicate. So it has to make copies of uh, the packet to be sent out for every receiver. And there are usual trade-offs. You need to look at complexity of deploying multicast versus amount of traffic you are going to send out. So if your traffic pattern is really heavy replicated or a lot of multicast, you might be actually better doing multicast. And there are solutions today to do EVPN multicast, which is mm -hmm. topic for another discussion. If it's just ARP where EVPN also provides you with um, uh, ARP proxy. So there's only single time ARP request sent out then the device that receives the ARP caches it and answers on behalf of the device. So there's actually no bound traffic at all. And if you look at modern, uh, modern silicon, we moved from really small replication group, about 3264 replications up to 768, up to 1024 replications per group. Uh, in most cases, uh, head and replication is the technology used in the data centers, and it works pretty well. So I hope this answers Great. the question. Another question was about layer two versus layer three VNIs. So yeah. VXLAN has no difference. VNI is a VNI. Uh, as, as we talked about looking up VNI value, what's important here is that you might be uh, using layer two, so you might be uh, switching traffic. In this case, common terminology is L2 VNI. So when receiving device receive a packet with particular VNI, the result of looking it up would be switching it to particular VLAN. L3 VNI usually refers to a VRF. So very similar to L3 VPN, when you receive a packet, you look up label, it results in particular VRF. You do exactly the same here. When you look up the packet, uh, VNI value will point to particular VRF. So you know the packet has to be routed, not switched. This is pretty much the difference. Uh, there's a lot of differences in EVPN, how this is signaled. And we'll be talking about symmetrical versus asymmetrical IRB. And this is where you will see the difference where in which EVP and route type this information included, how it gets into particular VRFs and routing policies associated with it. Cool. Well, I think uh, I think we're all out of time for today. In fact, we're a couple of minutes over, but um, uh, we'll we'll continue this discussion um, in our next session, I believe. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone, for your time. And we are looking forward to seeing you again very soon. Have a great day. Thanks, everybody.